10. Again, let us listen to the word of God. Jesus says, will any one of you who has a servant plowing or keeping sheep say to him when he has come in from the field, come at once and recline at table? Will he not rather say to him, prepare supper for me and dress properly and serve me while I eat and drink? And afterward, you will eat and drink. Does he thank the servant because he did what was commanded? So you also, when you have done all that you were commanded, say, we are unworthy servants. We have only done what was our duty. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. May God add his blessing to the reading and to the hearing of his holy word. Well, as we continue this sermon series on the parables of Jesus, we've come today to what I think is one of the hardest parables that he ever told, the parable of the workers in the vineyard. And I'm willing to bet that while Marilyn was reading that for us, that some of you were sitting there thinking, wait a minute, that's not fair. It's not fair. Why should the person who only worked one hour get paid the same amount as the person who worked 12 hours out in the hot sun? Why is Jesus rebuking people for protesting what seems to be an injustice? And that's what we're going to be looking at today. And we're going to see that what Jesus is actually doing is he's trying to lead us into a radical paradigm shift, a radical shift in the way that we look at life, a radical shift in the way that we look at the world around us. He's trying to move us away from thinking about our lives belonging to us. And so therefore, because they belong to us, then it's up to us to do everything we can to get the most happiness, the most success, the most meaning out of life, and to minimize pain and sorrow and troubles and anxiety as much as we can, to advocate for what is our due, what are our rights, what is rightfully ours. In other words, to move away from viewing life as trying to get as much as we can get out of it, and instead to shift to viewing our lives as belonging not to us, but to God. And so therefore, since they belong to God, that we need to do all that we can to serve Him the most, that we need to do all that we can to lift Him up in the best way possible, that we need to do all we can do to glorify Him the most, to show the most amount of gratitude, to serve His people in the best way possible. In other words, to look at life as how can we give the most we can give. As I said, that is a radical shift in the way that we look at life. And Jesus here is going to step on a lot of toes today. Notice how I threw the blame on him and not on me. I didn't write the book. I'm just telling you what it says. But this is a parable that we all, especially me, need to hear. So Jesus is telling a story about a vineyard. Now, those of you that were here a few weeks ago when we looked at the parable of the tenants, your ears may have perked up. You may have remembered me saying that whenever a vineyard appears like this in Scripture, it's almost always a symbol for Israel herself. So that gives us some context here. Jesus is talking about a big picture as he tells this parable. But it's the time for the harvest. It's the time to pick the grapes in this particular vineyard. And in Israel, that was always a bit of a scramble because when the grapes became ripe and ready for picking, 
It was always a rush to get them harvested before the fall rains started to come. Because when those rains and storms started to come, if you didn't have all of the grapes picked, part of your harvest could be ruined or destroyed. So that explains why the master, the owner of this vineyard, keeps going down into the marketplace and hiring more and more people to come and harvest the grapes from his vineyard. At this time, if you didn't have a permanent job, then what you would do is you'd go down into the marketplace, into the the town square, and that's where you would look for work. People would hire you on for the day if they had work for you that particular day. You You were a day laborer. You didn't know whether you'd have work or not. You didn't know what you'd be doing depending on what people needed. But this man goes at six in the morning, which was the beginning of the 12 hour long shift that was expected. And then he goes back at nine o'clock and he goes back at noon and he goes back at three and he even goes at five o'clock in the afternoon, hiring people to work for just one hour. That's how much he is looking for work, looking for workers. And those hired at the beginning of the day agreed that they would work for one denarius, which was traditionally a day's wage. And they agreed that they would be paid at the end of the day because most people, especially these day laborers, they were so close to the edge of poverty and starvation that if they didn't get paid that day, they didn't eat that day. So it was important that all of these things were worked out ahead of time. Now, those who were hired only for a partial day's work, they left it vague, you might have seen. They agreed that they would be paid whatever is right. They were probably so happy they were going to get paid anything at all, that they were willing to work for whatever. That meant they got something to eat that day. But when the day ends... The master does something that's really surprising. He starts with the people who had only worked an hour, and he pays them a denarius. He pays them as if they had worked the whole day. And he continues going down the line. Those who were hired at three, at noon, at nine, they get paid for the whole day. So naturally, those who were hired at six in the morning and who did work the whole day, they expected that they were going to get paid more because they worked more. And that's how it works, right? The more hours you work, the more you get paid. But the master gets to them and he pays them one denarius. And that doesn't make them one bit happy. Now, of course, this is a terrible way to run a business, okay? If anybody attempted to run their business in this way, I'd give it six weeks before it folded, right? Because you can imagine when word of this got out, the local news stations would come, people would be picketing unfair labor practices, there'd be YouTube videos that go viral of people complaining about how unfair it is. This business would not last. But of course, Jesus isn't talking about an actual vineyard here, is he? He's not talking about principles for running your business. He's talking about Israel and the kingdom of God. And there were some interesting things that were going on in Israel in Jesus' day. For one thing, there was a whole new group of people who previously had been on the outside that now were being welcomed in by Jesus. Sinners undesirable kinds of people. In fact, you read through the Gospels, a good portion of the Gospels are the Pharisees and the teachers of the law complaining that Jesus is hanging out with the wrong kind of people, and he really should know better 
you're judged by the company you keep, right? And that continued on into the early church. If you read the book of Acts and the letters of Paul, you find problems within the church as a whole new ethnic group of people. The Gentiles are suddenly welcomed into the church on the same footing as the Jewish believers. And they didn't first have to convert to Judaism before they converted to Christianity. And that made these Jewish believers who had been there from the very beginning upset that these new upstart outsiders are being welcomed and accepted in the same way that we are. It can still happen in churches today, can't it? when the power somehow passes from the old guard to the new guard. And the old guard starts to say, you know, we've been here for decades. And now all of a sudden, who do they think they are? They haven't been here all this time. They don't know what we know. And so Jesus tells this parable with this theme about new people, new folks being accepted and blessed in the same way that the old faithful people are. And this parable may just have been sparked by a question that Simon Peter asks in the previous chapter, in Matthew chapter 19. Jesus is teaching about the difficulties of wealth, how wealth can so very often get in the way of our faith if we're not careful, how it's easier, he says, for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a wealthy person to enter the kingdom of God. And all of a sudden, Simon Peter raises his hand and asks a question, and I'm paraphrasing here, this is not strictly from Scripture. Hey, Jesus, he says, look at all we've given up for you. You say it's hard that things, that possessions, that wealth gets in the way of faith. Look at all that we have given up for you. Remember that fishing business on the Sea of Galilee? Yeah, it was never much, but we gave it up for you. And remember our wives and our kids? We haven't seen them for a long time because we've been following you. And Matthew, remember Matthew? He had that really lucrative tax collecting business. He gave that up. For you And Simon, remember, he was a zealot. He was a freedom fighter. He was a terrorist. He was fighting to kick the Romans out of the country. He gave that up. It really meant a lot to him so that he could come and follow you. So now we were the first to give all of this up to come and follow you. So what reward do we get? What do we get in exchange, in return? for all that we have given for you. Right there, there's the problem that Jesus is addressing. That attitude of entitlement, of what is rightfully mine, of what I have a right to expect. And it's really insidious because we've been raised with this entitlement attitude from the time we were very young. Didn't mom or dad say to you, if you eat your broccoli, then you get a scoop of ice cream, right? If you do your homework, then you can watch an hour's worth of television. If you go to work, and, you know, actually work while you're there, put in a full shift, then you have a right to be expect to be paid X amount of dollars. There's nothing wrong with that. That's how a lot of the world works. And, and that actually encourages a lot of really good virtues like responsibility and, and, and uh, loyalty and working hard and all of that. The problem comes when we start to translate that into our relationship with God. And when we bring that into the way that we run our churches... Pastor and evangelist R.A. Torrey writes that once he was doing a a day-long seminar teaching on prayer, 
And partway through the day, after he'd finished the morning session and they were breaking for lunch, somebody came up and handed him a note which had been written by somebody in the congregation. And here's what the note says. Dear Mr. Torrey, I am in great perplexity. I have been praying for a long time for something that I am confident is according to the will of God, but I haven't gotten it. I have been a member of the Presbyterian Church for 30 years, and I've tried to be a consistent one all that time. I have been superintendent in the Sunday school for 25 years. I've been an elder of the church for 20 years, and yet God does not answer my prayer, and I can't understand it. Can you explain it to me? I've done all this for God and he hasn't answered my prayer. Can you explain it? Is that a letter that you could write? The big idea that's undergirding that letter and that undergirds so much of the way that we think and so much of the way that we look at life is God owes me. God owes me. I've done all this for God. I've worked hard for him. I've kept my nose clean. So now I'm entitled to blessings. Now I'm entitled to a reward from God. It's the same attitude the older brother had in the parable of the prodigal son. It's the same attitude that the Pharisee had in the parable of the Pharisee and the tax collector. Remember, he stood up in the temple and he informed God of how good he was and all the things that he'd done. It's the same attitude that so many of us have today, that we think of our lives as our own, that my life is all about me. So therefore, I want to live the best possible life I can live. I want to maximize my happiness and my blessings. I want to minimize my amount of trouble and pain. So I know I'll become a Christian and I'll get on God's good side and I'll do lots of good works and then he'll owe me a good life in return, right? Because God blesses good people and God punishes bad people, right? Well, yes and no. The problem is there's a lot that gets left out of that way of looking at life. For one thing, Jesus lived the best possible life, right? And look what they did to him. The Apostle Paul arguably did more for the church than anyone in history other than Jesus, and he suffered terribly. He was in prison for years and years and years. On his missionary journeys, you read about him getting beaten and stoned and thrown in jail and kicked out of city after city. But ultimately, even though he was executed for his faith, he was willing to go through all of that Because Paul and the Christian martyrs understood something that so many of us never get, which is that God owes us nothing. God owes us nothing. Now, that's a really provocative statement right there that I've made. And I may have shocked some of you, but it's true. There is absolutely no way that we could put God in our debt. Because the truth is, we already doubly belong to God. God owes us nothing. We owe him everything. Because we doubly belong belong to him. We belong to him in the first place because he made us. And when you make something, it belongs to you, right? You bake a cake, that's your cake. You sew a shirt, that's your shirt. You build a house, it's your house. You paint a picture, it's your picture. You can do with it what you want. Well, God made the world, including us. So we belong to him. Now, of course, 
we rebelled against him, didn't we? We declared war against him. We ran away from him. We said, God, we don't want you to be God. We want to be our own gods. And we ended up selling ourselves into slavery, to sin and death. But God, praise the Lord, didn't leave us that way. God invaded our world to reclaim it for himself, ushering in what he calls the kingdom of God. And the price of that was his son. The price of our salvation, of him buying us out of our slavery to sin and death and the devil was his own blood. As the Apostle Paul says, you are not your own. You were bought at a price. And the price was the blood of Jesus Christ. And here's the big the big paradigm shift that I was talking about at the beginning of the sermon. When we get that, when we begin to accept that idea that we owe everything to God because look at what he has done for us. He created us and then he saved us at the price of his own son, at the price of his own blood, even though we don't deserve it, then life becomes less about me and what I can get out of it, and what I can take from life. And life becomes more about how can I show my gratitude to God? How can I serve the God who has served me so well? How can I show my love for God who has loved me so well? How can I decrease so that Jesus Christ increases? That's what Jesus is getting at in that provocative statement in our second reading. When you've done all that you were commanded, say, we are unworthy servants. We are only doing our duty. Jesus wasn't being rude there. He was just telling a hard truth. No matter what we do, we can't put God in our debt because we already belong fully to him and he's already given everything to us. He gave us his son. He promised that when his son comes again that he would give us the kingdom, not because we've earned it, not because we've done something to deserve it, but simply because that's who God is a generous God, a gracious God. We could never earn salvation, but he freely gives the gift of salvation simply because he loves us, because that's his nature, that's his character. He is a God of grace. So often we hear, you are not your own, you don't belong to yourself, your life doesn't belong to you, you belong to God. And we say, oh, that's terrible news. I don't want to live that way. I don't want to belong to somebody. I don't want to have to bow down to somebody. I don't want to have to submit to somebody. Jesus says, no, 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 no. It's the best news possible because he's the best master you could possibly serve. He's the only master who is ever willing to die for the servants. And his yoke is easy. And his burden is light. And when we get that, then our worldview begins to change. And we become people not of entitlement, but people of gratitude. And we realize, you know what? It really is a wonderful thing that the master gave those folks that were hired on at 5 p.m. a whole denarius because guess what? They need it. If they don't get that denarius, they may not eat today. Isn't it incredible how generous the master is? That even though they only worked for an hour, they got a whole day's wage. Would we begrudge that kind of kindness and generosity simply because we're jealous? And you know what? We got a denarius too. We who have worked the whole 12 hours, just as he promised, just as he said, praise the Lord, we get to eat today as well. Just like he promised, we get our daily bread. They get their daily bread too. It's wonderful. The master is so great, isn't it? 
And we realize that just the fact that we get to work in the vineyard of our master, that is an honor. That is a privilege. That is a reward in and of itself. When we move from that attitude of entitlement to an attitude of gratitude to an attitude of humility and service, we begin to realize God blesses us a lot. God is so generous, so good. He's given us Jesus. He's going to give us the kingdom. Anything else we get is just icing on the cake. As I said, it's a tough parable to hear. But it's one that we need to hear, me especially. We don't like these lessons on humility. We don't like these lessons on service and gratitude. But Jesus teaches them anyway. And let me remind you, he doesn't just talk about these things. He lived them as well. He humbled himself. He emptied himself of glory and became a human being. He lived as a servant of people who belonged to him, people he created, people who rightfully should have been bowing down in service to him. By his becoming poor, we have now become rich. By his becoming weak, we have now become strong. By his dying on the cross, we now have new and eternal life, and we are just unworthy servants. And he's given all this to us anyway. So this week, in response, in gratitude, let's break those attitudes daily of entitlement and selfishness. And let's remember, life's not all about me. Life's not all about getting what I think I deserve. God owes us nothing, but God has given us everything at the cost of his grace and his love and his blood. So what this week can I do in response? What way can I humble myself and serve and show my gratitude to God? Who can I pray for this week? This is what I want us to think and pray about. Who can I go and visit? Who needs a ride that I can provide one? Who needs a meal that I can cook and take to them? Who needs an encouraging note that I can write and send to them? Who has a bill that I can pay or something broken that I can fix? Who needs to be forgiven? Who needs to be shown love? And how can I do that? In humble service to the Lord who has done so much for me. Let's live our lives in humility and gratitude and service. Let's bless his people and worship him. Let's humble ourselves so that Christ can be exalted. To him alone be the glory. Let us pray. Lord, we thank you for these tough lessons, these reminders that we belong to you and that that is fantastic news. Help us, Lord, to live lives of thanksgiving and humility and service. And as we come to your table, nourish us for these tasks that you lay before us. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's stand and sing.